Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, you have a fascinating background. I've heard you speak a number of times, and so perhaps rather than my reading more of your bio, uh, you could tell us a bit about your, your education, your career, uh, where you grew up. Sure. So I was born and raised in Ohio. I studied engineering at the University of Illinois. I uh, did my bachelor's and master's at the University of Illinois and worked in aerospace for a few years before going back to business school to get my MBA. Then I joined Goldman Sachs in California where I worked as a tech technology investment banker. Uh, long story short, I had a chance to go with Hank Paulson when he became Treasury Secretary to the U.S. Treasury Department. I was at U.S. Treasury from 2006 to 2009 under both, I was appointed by President Bush, but I stayed under President Obama for a while because we were still in the throes of the financial crisis. During that time, I ran the TARP program, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, when I was an Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, went back to California, joined PIMCO for a few years, uh, then eventually found my way to Minnesota. Uh, and I've been here for four years as president of the Minneapolis Fed, and uh, very happy to be here. So thank you. That's great. Well, welcome. Um, so I, like I said, I've, I've had a chance to see you, see you speak before, and uh, uh, President Kashgar and I both live in uh, Orono, Minnesota, in a small community. So I've seen you speak to big groups of professionals like this, but also, uh, you know, to smaller, more more intimate, informal groups. And I've always been impressed with your ability to make complex topics such as Federal Reserve operations uh, and policy simple. So in the audience, we have nearly 1,500 of Thrivent's financial professionals who serve our over 200, 2 million members uh, in all 50 states. It's their job to make complicated financial matters understandable for our clients. Uh, so with that in mind, could you give us a little overview of what the Federal Reserve System is and how it functions? Sure. And thanks for having me. This is, you know, the Federal Reserve is our nation's central bank. And one of the things that is different about our central bank versus other countries is that our central bank is spread out all across our nation instead of just being all housed in the capital. So there's the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. I'm sure you've heard of Jerome Powell. He's the chairman of the Federal Reserve before uh, Jerome or Jay Powell, as we call them, was Janet Yellen and then Ben Bernanke. But then you have 12 independent Federal Reserve banks spread out across the region. So a big part of my job is literally to represent this region, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and Northwestern Wisconsin in the nation's monetary policy making. So Congress has given us what we call our dual mandate. You might read about this in the press. One of our goals is stable prices, what we define as 2% inflation. Think of an economy that's not overheating, but also not limping along. And then maximum employment. As many Americans as possible in the workforce, working, able to provide for themselves. And so we move interest rates up and down to try to manage those two different goals in addition to regulating banks and a number of things. So being here with you today is important for me because Thriven is one of the biggest employers in this region. So it's a great chance for me to hear directly from all of you what, what are you seeing in the economy? What are you experiencing? That'll make me more informed when I go back to, back to Washington, D.C. for our uh, FOMC meetings that you also hear about. Great. Well, thank you. Well, uh, moving on to, to Fed policy, and I, uh, I think uh, our fixed income team would come after me with torches and pitchforks if I didn't ask you a question or two about the dot plot. Um, and my specific question is about the dot plot, and perhaps President Kashkari can explain better than I what that is for the audience, but, uh, but specifically how it relates uh, to bond market expectations. We've got a number of uh, members of our board of directors in the audience, and really, for the past year, starting really in 2018, uh, we started to focus on uh, the divergence between uh, the market's expectations for future rates and what was shown in the, in the dot plot, which is the expectations uh, articulated by the various uh, Fed presidents. And, and we looked at a number of charts about how when those diverge, you tend to see not only higher interest rate volatility, but higher equity volatility. I think that's a part of what we saw uh, in December. Um, I heard you say recently that the dot plot has been providing contractionary forward guidance. Uh, and then on CNBC yesterday, hopefully all of you got up early enough to see President Kashkari on CNBC yesterday. It was a wonderful interview. Uh, you took it maybe one step further uh, and suggested that the Fed could provide forward guidance to the effect that it won't raise rates until inflation exceeds the Fed's stated 2% target. So my question uh, is, has the dot plot been too hawkish, or has the market under misunderstood the purpose of the dot plot? Well, this is a, uh, it's a very complicated topic, and I'll try to uh, explain my answer simply. So we move, when we want to uh, adjust the economy, we move what's called the federal funds rate up and down. It's an overnight interest rate that banks charge each other. But you and me as consumers, or your clients, you don't care about overnight interest rates. 
You care about long-term interest rates because if you take out a mortgage, you care what your interest rate's gonna be over the next 10 years. So why do we move overnight interest rates up and down? We move them up and down because they can have some effect on long-term interest rates. And this is where this notion of forward guidance comes in. If we were to tell you, hypothetically, I'm not predicting this, <laughs> if we were to tell you that we're gonna lower the overnight interest rate to zero, and then we're gonna commit to you that we're gonna hold it at zero for the next 10 years, you would expect 10-year interest rates to be pretty darn close to zero. So that commitment is a way of giving you guidance about the path of short-term interest rates that can actually have a lot of effect on long-term rates. So five or six years ago, the Federal Reserve introduced this thing called the dot plot, which is uh, once a quarter, all the participants in the FOMC put out our own interest rate projections of what we think is ideal for the US economy. And then you can look at the range of those, there's a wide range of those, and get some sense of what do you think the Fed is really gonna do over the next few years. If you look since the dot plot has existed, it, was, it has basically always been wrong to the upside. It has always been forecasting a lot of interest rate inter increases to come, which then, if it has any effect on market expectations, it's telling all of you and telling market participants rate hikes are coming, and that will then dampen economic activity. And so I think knowing what we know now with the benefit of hindsight, the dot plot has been a hawkish tool. When I think it was originally conceived of being a dovish tool by saying we're going to keep rates low for long, so I don't think it actually worked the way it was originally intended. Yeah. Okay. You know, maybe put differently, and then I'll, I'll, I'll then I'll stop with the dot plot. I promise. It's okay. You know, I, 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 and we'll probably come back to the different tools available to the Federal Reserve, but one important tool is is forward guidance, um, and you know. Is the dot plot a form of forward guidance? Should it be? Is it something different than forward guidance? I know it's not a commitment, it's a tool, but how do you think about the dot plot and forward guidance? It's, it is, whether we like it or not, it is a tool of forward guidance because we are telling people, here are 17 individual projections of what we each think are optimal monetary policy and how the economy will respond. You know, you, there's, there's some information contained in that. So whether we like it or not, it is a form of forward guidance. A stronger form of forward guidance is if we made an announcement, what I've been advocating for for the last several months that you mentioned, that we would announce that we will not raise interest rates until we get core inflation back to our 2% target. We've been undershooting inflation for basically six or eight years, so why don't we commit not to raise rates until we actually achieve that? That would be a stronger form of forward guidance than the dot plot, which is not a formal commitment, though it's a hint of where we think rates are gonna go. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit, uh, when you joined the Treasury Department in 2006, uh, Secretary Paulson directed his staff, I believe including you, to work with various financial regulators, including the SEC, to look for what might trigger the next crisis. Uh, I know I've heard you mention that the Fed is bad at predicting re recessions. If you knew there was going to be a recession, you'd take steps to prevent it. I'd maybe give the Fed a little credit and say, we also don't see the recessions that you prevented, but that's a different way of looking at it. Uh, but the upshot is that recessions are usually caused uh, by something that wasn't uh, or couldn't be foreseen. Uh, so I know I'm asking you to speculate a bit, but are, are there areas in which you see excessive leverage or some other characteristic that could spark a recession? I think people, uh, many people have identified that the corporate sector generally is pretty highly levered relative to where it was five years ago or 10 years ago. That's an area we and others pay a lot of attention to, the leveraged loan market more specifically, so highly indebted companies are getting more indebted. Uh, that's another area that we pay a lot of attention to. Some of my colleagues have looked at commercial real estate in recent years. You know, the WeWork fiasco has gotten a lot of attention. People have said, well, that's an evidence. That's evidence of excessive risk-taking, frothiness, et cetera. Um, it also repriced, right? It, it adjusted itself uh, on its own, which is probably a good thing. So those are some of the areas where people look at. We have a whole team of economists in Washington who are dedicated to looking at different asset classes for signs of excess valuations or frothiness or risk-taking and how an adjustment could then translate into financial instability and into a recession. You know, if we saw signs of excesses in some asset class, and we said, okay, great, now we're gonna go raise rates to try to deal with that, you might trigger the very crisis you're worried about. And so you have to be very careful about this on what you actually do if you think you're seeing signs of excesses. And then I, I always remind folks, it's very hard to know what is in fact a bubble, and then to know 
will it actually lead to real economic harm if the bubble bursts? So in 1996, Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan famously said there's irrational exuberance in the stock market. The stock market then climbed for the next four years, and then it burst, right? The 2000, 2001 tech bubble bursting. That bursting only ended up causing a mild recession. I'm of the view if the Federal Reserve in 96 tried to raise interest rates to prevent the stock market from climbing, that the medicine would have been much more damaging than the actual recession that ended up happening. And so we have to be very thoughtful about the tools we have and what we could do, even if we thought we saw signs of a bubble. Yeah. You know, I think you mentioned uh, one area of concern. I kind of pulled our investment team and the area of concern that I think we were most concerned about, because these things tend to come in areas where there's excessive leverage, uh, was the issuance of low, very low investment grade, low triple B bonds. I assume that's part of what you were uh, referring to. What about recent developments? Uh, you, know, you, seen, you mentioned the leveraged loan market. You know, the overall credit market has actually been quite strong and stable. Uh, I believe you know, it, it, upgrades and downgrades uh, in, in between investment grade and junk have been actually pretty stable uh, in recent, uh, recent months. But uh, we have seen spreads gap out in the, in the leveraged loan market. Now, some of that, I assume, is probably energy exposure. But is that something that concerns you at this point in time or not yet? Well, it's a couple things. One is we pay very close attention to it so that hopefully we're not going to be surprised. Because we want to we want to play this out. Let's say it continues to get worse. What's the mechanism or the channel that it translates into hurting the real economy? And one of the channels, what we all experienced in 2008, was financial instability in the banking sector. And so one of the things that we've done at the Minneapolis Fed for many years, including since I've been here, is really try to drive home the point of, hey, let's deal with the too big to fail issue. Let's make sure the biggest banks in America have enough capital so if there is one of these big adjustments, that the banks don't run into trouble and then require another bailout or risk bringing down the U.S. economy. And so, you know, if, if just in the sector that you talked about, is the right policy response to those warning signs raising interest rates? I think the answer is no. That doesn't mean we should just go raise interest rates for its own reason. But how do we make sure the system is resilient? Making sure the banks have enough capital is the best thing we could do. Yeah, and you know, I know bank capital has been a, a focus of yours and something you, you're, you're known for emphasizing. Um, and, and how do you think about uh, the capital ratios of large versus small banks? And you know, used to have a, a thrift, uh, we now have a, a credit union, affiliated credit union and uh, a trust company. Um, how do you think about capital of large versus small banks? Well, it's, um, it's, it's the reverse today of what it should be. Today, small banks across America generally are much more highly capitalized than the giant trillion dollar banks. It's the opposite of what it should be, right? The big giant banks are the ones that if they run into trouble, will, could bring down the US economy or could require a bailout as they did in 2008. Heaven forbid, if a small bank runs into trouble, it's not gonna bring down the US economy. And so it's literally the reverse of what it should be. And that's part of the reason we've been advocating as loudly as we can that we should make sure the big banks have enough capital, and then we can relax regulations on some of the community banks that are not risky for the economy. Yeah. Um, staying on the topic of banks for a little bit, you know, one of the effects of Dodd-Frank was to make some of the large banks uh, much more reluctant to uh, take bonds, hold bonds in inventory, and hold, hold securities on their balance sheet. Uh, and, you know, as, as institutional investors, particularly institutional fixed income investors, we see that lack of liquidity all the time. Um, how do you think about that? And how do you think about that in the context of a crisis? You know, I've heard that a lot, and I'm pretty dismissive of it. Um, I don't really buy it. I mean, if you all want to trade with other major asset managers, they've got bonds you want to buy, I think you'll figure out how to do it. I don't believe this notion that you need to have this warehouse in the middle, and somebody's just holding all these IBM bonds, waiting for you to call and say, hey, give me the IBM bonds, and now you can't buy them. So I think that... Wall Street is very good at making arguments that are advocating for lowering their regulations because it's good for their stock price. Uh, I hear this all the time, so uh, I just, I'm pretty skeptical. And you can push back on me, by the way, feel free. Um, no, no, I, <laughs> no my, my view is, I think if you talk to our fixers, it's real, it's not, you can get the trades done. Um, and and it, it's probably less of an issue in, uh, a, a well-functioning market like we've had. Uh, I guess what's untested is what happens in a financial crisis. Liquidity is always there until you really need it. And uh, what happens in a time that looks a little more like 2008? Well, okay, but here's the thing. So let's say, uh, hypothetically, I'm an asset manager working at your, I'm a 
fixed income portfolio manager. I got a bunch of IBM bonds in my portfolio and I want to sell them and markets are cratering. The price is going to drop. It's not as though this Wall Street dealer, oh, we're in the inventory business. We're going to go buy those bonds at the price you wanted to sell them to us yesterday. No, if the markets are dropping, the price is going to drop and the price is going to drop. Yep. And so I just, every time I try to think through the logic of this, um, this noble wholesaler in the middle, just re ready to stand there and provide you the price you want, I just don't buy it. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the, the scenario... And by the way, in 08, how did that work out? So in 08, the banks had much lower capital requirements. Yeah. Were they all standing there ready to make the trades that you wanted to make? Or were they running for the hills? I remember them running for the hills. Yeah. No. You know, one area that you, maybe you could see some stress would be uh, with the growth of ETFs, particularly, say, high-yield ETFs. Um, you know, if you have a, a, a you know, $100 billion high-yield ETF and you get massive redemptions, you know, it, it's not clear who takes the other side of that trade. Sure. No, 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 for sure. And that's, by the way, so you're partially in the mutual fund business. I mean, this is something we look at, the systemic risk of holding long-term assets with immediate or daily liquidity. Yeah. Right? That is a, that's, you know, why do banks get into trouble? because you can withdraw your money tomorrow, and they had turned around and made a long-term loan with it. And it's that maturity mismatch that is a source of financial instability, potentially, both in banks, but also in these investment vehicles. But I don't think the broker-dealers having lower capital requirements makes that problem any better. No, no, and I don't know that it's necessarily related directly to capital, but that's very helpful, thank you. Um, so another question, uh, about half of Thrive-In's $135 billion in assets under management are the general account of our insurance company that backs our life, health, and, and fixed annuity contracts. Uh, our job, of course, is like every insurance company to match the duration of our assets and liabilities. So even with bonds seemingly very expensive in a low rate environment, uh, we still have to be buyers of fixed income assets. Um, as someone charged with overseeing financial stability, uh, how do you try to distinguish between investors reaching for yield and a rational repricing of assets to a lower neutral rate due to demographic or other factors? You know, it's a, it's a tough thing because a lot of people will say, and this came up in the interview that you referenced, uh, I guess it was yesterday, a lot of people say, well, boy, the Fed's holding rates low. It's forcing investors to go reach for yield. This is leading to financial instability. And just as you said, I push back and say, one person's reaching for yield, maybe another person's repricing. So let's talk about interest rates for a second. Interest rates are low relative to history in America, but are interest rates low relative to neutral? I think the answer is no. So the notion of what interest rate is neutral, what interest rate neither stimulates nor restrains the economy, we don't set that. That is set by broader economic forces such as demographics, savings, productivity development. And we're pretty sure over the last 30 or 40 years, the neutral interest rate in advanced economies has gradually been declining. So we cut the federal funds rate last week or a couple weeks ago. I think interest rates are now around neutral or modestly accommodative. They're not very, very accommodative. So if investors are now understanding this and understanding that we're likely going to be in a low interest rate environment for the foreseeable future, and if you value assets by discounting cash flows, and you have an asset that has the same cash flows, but now you're discounting them at a lower interest rate, that could lead to a higher valuation. And so that's why also, going back to financial stability, is this, are these valuations out of line, or are they actually in line with the new fundamentals that we're experiencing? It's, I wish I had a very clear answer for you. It's a very important yeah. question. Well, it's one we ask ourselves every day as we're, as we're, we're, buy, we're buying securities and, and, and private assets. Um, Maybe moving on to your, uh, to your role uh, in the Treasury Department, um, you served as a head of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP. Uh, I think I, as I was watching a number of your prior speeches. I think you uh, referenced the Cowan Press. I think it might have been Secretary Paulson who uh, observed that more Americans are supportive of waterboarding than they are of TARP. <laughs> it's true, by a, by a long margin, by the way. <laughs> um, but I'm actually getting to a positive question here. Um, it's okay. I, I actually, I personally think that's unfair. Um, many of the programs under the broad umbrella of TARP turned out to actually be quite profitable for, for taxpayers. Um, I had one of our analysts run some math, and I think it was dependent on whether we included the auto companies or not. It was 15 to 25 billion, roughly, of, of profits to the Treasury. I don't know if my numbers are exactly right. But uh, so even though they're generally referred to as bailouts, these ultimately didn't cost uh, taxpayers. 
do you have other thoughts on, and I know you're a free market person, but uh, how public-private cooperation could help achieve broader economics or societal objectives? Infrastructure would come to mind as, as a possibility. Well, the financial crisis was one of the worst moments, not the worst, one of the worst moments in our nation's economic history. But it was a time, and it was a time of great political anxiety and, and in addition to economic anxiety. But our political system worked in that moment. Right? Between the, when the intensity of the crisis after Lehman failed, when Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke went to Congress to ask for this unprecedented $700 billion authority, they got together and voted for it on a bipartisan basis in two weeks. I mean, that is lightning speed for any democracy. So I think in times of, I think in times of crisis, our democracy is very good at people coming together. And in that moment, you know, the private sector had roles to play. We leaned on the private sector to do certain things. I actually think that that worked. I think the tougher challenge for us now is when we're not in an acute crisis, how do we get people to come together to make tough choices, to put the country first? You know, a lot of people who voted for the TARP, a lot of the congressmen and women paid for that vote with their seats. That's what we want them to do, right? We want them to put their country before their own careers. You know, but it's a tough lesson when they do it and then they don't end up having their jobs going forward. And so I think the challenge for all of us is we have lots of challenges we face as a country. How can we bring people together? We don't want to wait for a crisis. We want to try to avert the crisis if we can. What was it like being in the Treasury Department at that time? I mean, things has had to be moving at just the speed of light. It was. It was. Um, it felt like, you know, I've never served in the military, but it felt like the economic equivalent of 9-11, which was, you know, we weren't, nobody was physically shooting at us. Uh, we were not at risk of death, but we literally what motivated us was if we don't keep the system together, literally the entire financial system will collapse. And instead of the terrible 10% unemployment that we did experience, we'd be facing a Great Depression scenario of 25% unemployment. And if you had in that scenario thousands of banks failing, how would we begin to put the pieces back together? So it was uh, terrifying. And I mean, honestly, it's like an experience that was burned into me and I think to many others. Yeah. You, know, you mentioned uh, unemployment. Um, you know, I, I think you have a particular view about uh, the amount of slack in the, in the labor market and particularly what that means for inflation ultimately for Fed policy. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. One of the things that's really surprised us over the last few years is how many more Americans wanted to work. So the headline unemployment rate today is around 3.6%, which based on history is very, very low. Usually you would think, okay, we're there. We're beyond full employment. It's funny, right after the financial crisis, there was a narrative in the economics community that was conventional wisdom. Unemployment rate to 10%. Many Americans lost their jobs and couldn't find work for years. And the economics community said, they're gone. If you've been out of work for a year or two, you're never coming back. And so the permanent level of unemployed Americans has now ratcheted up because they've just been left the labor force never to be, never to return. And that dominated our thinking. Mm -hmm. And so as, we, as the economy started to heal and the unemployment rate came down to seven, to six, to five and a half, a lot of people said, oh, we're there. We're at full employment now because the unemployment rate has permanently gone up. That was 100% wrong, 100% wrong. And this is good news, because as the unemployment rate has come down and as wages have slowly started to climb, a lot of people said, you know what? I do want to work. I may have been out of work for five years, but I do want to work, and they're taking jobs. And that's good for the overall productive capacity of the US economy, and it's good for those individuals, and it's good for their families, and it's good for the communities. And we still do not know when we're going to reach the limit. We know at some point, you know, you can't go beyond 100% employment, right? That doesn't work. At some point, we're going to reach the boundaries of full employment or maximum employment. But by my estimation, we're not there yet. And I want the economy to continue to grow, to bring as many people in so that they can benefit from the recovery. Yeah, and as is, is you were approaching, as you approach full employment, what indicators would you be looking at? Presumably something like wage growth would be, would you, which has been a little bit slower than you might have expected? Yes, that's exactly right. So we're trying to, ultimately, what are we doing? We are trying to assess supply and demand in the market for labor. And if you want to assess supply and demand in a market, start by looking at the price. If demand is outstripping supply, you would expect the price to go up. Well, the price of labor is wage growth. 
and wages are now growing around 3% per year. They have picked up in recent years, but they're not accelerating. If anything, they're decelerating. And net of, you would expect, on average, wages to grow with inflation plus productivity. And right now, wages are growing slower than inflation plus, plus productivity, which tells me we're not there yet. We are not really at maximum employment. Great. Well, that's good. Um, Shifting gears to maybe something uh, completely off topic, but I, I've heard you speak on this topic before, and I think the crowd would find it interesting. Uh, maybe talking a little, I have some idea what you're going to say. Talk a little bit about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Uh, I get asked about this less than I did a year or two ago. Uh, basically, I think it's a farce. Uh, you know, the, the, the barrier to entry, so wh why is the dollar special, or the euro, or the pound? The dollar is special because the US government has a monopoly. They're the only ones allowed to create dollars. If you go to your basement and crank up the printing press, the Secret Service is gonna come knock on your door and put you into jail. That's how they preserve that monopoly. And that scarcity is what gives them that value because the government stands behind it. Well, the barrier to entry for any cryptocurrency is zero. There are literally thousands of these cryptocurrencies out there that are just garbage coins out there, and you can't tell them apart. And so unless somebody comes up with a way of saying, no, this is the one cryptocurrency that counts, all the others ignore them. And until everybody agrees with that, it's just a big garbage collection. And you know, I like to do this. I go to universities, and usually students will like to ask me about cryptocurrency. And I always ask them one question. Is there anybody in this audience who has ever actually bought something with Bitcoin? And usually, the, someone will raise their hand, and I'll say, what did you buy? He's like, well, I bought Bitcoin. I'm like, no, that doesn't count. <laughs> right? I'm talking about an actual good, a book, a pack of gum, something. And almost always the answer is no. And it's so, so far, it's just a novelty. It's like Pez dispensers, courtesy of Silicon Valley. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you this. I was, my wife and I, my wife is from the Philippines. We went to the Philippines a couple years ago and we were flying back and we were going through customs at uh, LAX. And the customs officer saw my, he asked me what I did. I handed him my passport. He's like, what do you do for a living? He said, I work at the Federal Reserve. And he, his eyes lit up. He said, oh, Federal Reserve. Tell me about Bitcoin. He said, one of my buddies, <laughs> one of my buddies just took out a home equity loan to buy Bitcoin. Oh. Should I do that? <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm not allowed to give you investment advice, but no, do not Don't do that. Do that. <laughs> uh, I hope he listened. Uh, I thought you might get a laugh on that. Uh, so shifting to a, a more serious topic, and then I, we have some questions that have been submitted by our financial professionals. But uh, I, I know an area that's uh, near and dear to your heart, and I would say it's probably near and dear to everyone in this room, uh, is education, uh, and particularly uh, disparities in financial education. I know it's an area that Thrive-In and its various philanthropic efforts has, has sought to address. Um, you wrote an, uh, an editorial a few weeks ago with uh, Ellen Page, a famous uh, defensive lineman and, and Supreme Court justice. Maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, education disparities, I guess, primarily in your territory, but nationally as well, and, and what we can do about them. Yeah, so this is something that uh, Minneapolis Fed has worked on for a long time on early childhood education, which we continue to focus on. We really think that's important. We're also now looking at K through 12 disparities. The reason I care, aside from my own personal interest, my own personal caring about this topic, there's no more important determinant of success in the job market than education. So if we want to achieve maximum employment, we actually need to educate all of our neighbors and our citizens. So that's why I care from a Federal Reserve perspective. But Alan Page, former Justice Page, and I got together. Uh, I'm looking at this through the lens of the economy. He's looking at it through the lens of his 22 years on Minnesota's Supreme Court. And you know, moving to Minnesota, Minnesota has some wonderful things going for us, a very diverse economy, on average an educated workforce, on average very good schools, but some of the biggest education disparities in the country. Basically, if you're a low-income Minnesotan of any race, chances are high that your kids are not getting a good education. Or if you're a Minnesotan of color, chances are high your kids are also not getting a good education. So what can we do to actually close these gaps? So Justice Page and I right now are working on, with our researchers, uh, on a plan to try to actually change this. For 20 years, 
Minnesota has made very good faith efforts to try to close the gap. But if we're being honest with each other, we've made zero progress, literally zero progress. And it doesn't have to be so. There are states around the country that are putting power back in the hands of parents and families and kids. And we're looking at ways to try to do that, to look at what we've learned around the country that we could bring to Minnesota. And you think that's a big part of the solution, returning power back to parents and families? So, you know, every, one of the things I've learned, everybody says they're for kids first, but when really push comes to shove, it's usually the adults who get in the way. And so Justice Page and I are looking at how do you really put, how do you truly put kids first, not just in name, but in actual power. And, uh, and we're working on it. Good, well said. Well, sticking with education for one more question before we, uh, we take some from, uh, from our financial professionals. Uh, you have, I, I have an unusual uh, educational background for a chief investment officer, and you've got an interesting background for a Federal Reserve president uh, having an engineer. I believe it was aerospace engineering. I, I've often thought that diversity in educational backgrounds, like other forms of diversity, can you know, bring new perspectives uh, to discussions. Can you talk a little bit about how your engineering background might actually benefit your work at the Fed? Sure. I, actually, I think it does a lot. I, I think, so the Fed has, we've, we're the biggest hirer, the biggest employer of PhD economists in the world. We have some brilliant PhD economists, especially at the Minneapolis Fed. Uh, but I think we really benefit from having that diversity of experiences. So around the Federal Open Market Committee, you have a number of the principals, Fed presidents and governors, who are PhD economists, and they have a tremendous amount to contribute. But then you also have business professionals and other executives who are there. And I think our skills complement each other. For me as a policymaker, though, I'll tell you this. When I went to Treasury, I had the most remarkable thing happen. You know, I, I'd done my engineering degrees, worked as an aerospace engineer, got my MBA in finance from Wharton. When I got to Treasury, I found myself using my engineering way more than I used my MBA. Because what do engineers do? Engineers are problem solvers. And what is policy making? You have a public policy problem. You have certain tools. You have to unravel the problem to try to solve it. That's fundamentally what engineers do. And so I've actually found, it's not the thermodynamics, literally, or the fluid dynamics that I studied in engineering school, but it's the basic toolkit of problem solving. I think there's a lot of uh, similarities between engineering and economics in that regard. So for me, I think it's really uh, trained me well, and it's taught me a way to use, to lean on, and learn from our economists that I work with every day. So I, I, feel, I feel better for it. That's great. Well, thank you. So I'll turn. Uh, we have a few questions that were uh, submitted, uh, but we wanted to pass the microphone, but with this many people, it wasn't practical. Uh, so I'll ask a couple of these. Uh, uh, Maria, the first one is from uh, Ray, uh, one of my good friends, actually, in uh, Benham, Texas. And uh, Ray's question is, uh, what has been uh, the economic impact of negative rates on the European countries that have enacted them, and what would cause uh, the Federal Reserve to implement negative rates? Well, this is, so the negative policy rates, I'll, let's talk about Europe for a second. They have negative policy rates on the front end, so the overnight rate that the central bank sets. But if you actually look out the yield curve, they're negative actually pretty far out the yield curve too. Central banks, generally speaking, are not setting the long rate. As I talked about earlier, we set a short rate. So I'll give you an example. If the Federal Reserve were to cut the front end, cut the short rate, artificially low, would the long rate go up or down? It's unclear yeah. because inflation expectations should go up if the short rate is artificially low. That could cause the long rate to go up. So it may move up, it may move down. The point is that we have a lot less influence over long rates than people assume. So if the long rates are negative in Europe, my, my opinion is that is mostly being driven by broader macroeconomic factors. That neutral interest rate environment are driving rates down to zero or down to negative, and the central bank is following the economy down to zero or down to negative rather than driving the economy down to zero or down to negative. So imagine if we had a recession in the US. It's not inconceivable to think the 10-year Treasury right now is around 175. You could see that go a lot lower if we were in a recession. Imagine, hypothetically, we were in a recession and the US 10-year Treasury, due to macro forces, went to a zero yield. Under that scenario, might it make sense for the Federal Reserve to move the front end negative, to give some positive slope to the yield curve? In that scenario, I could argue that might make sense. I'm not predicting it, I'm not in favor of it, but I'm just giving you an example of what could lead us 
to have negative rates in the U.S. Now, my colleagues at the Federal Reserve have been very blunt, saying if there were a downturn, we would likely use uh, quantitative easing again. We would likely use forward guidance. Uh, negative rates, I don't want to say it would be the, it might be the last thing that we yeah. would do. Yeah. Not something we would will, you know, willingly want to do. But this is the point. The macro economy is having a lot of effect on central banks. Sometimes people get the causation reversed. Yeah, so you mentioned three tools the Fed has, uh, cutting rates, uh, quantitative easing, asset purchases, uh, and forward guidance. Um, you know, some thinks, think that monetary policy overall has become less effective, and perhaps it's been, certainly been less effective in, in Europe. Um, I guess my question is, which of those three, you know, how would you prioritize? Do you think one has become more effective than the other? The sense I've gotten from reading some of your speeches is you may be more inclined to engage in forward guidance than some other Fed presidents, but how do you kind of prioritize what you would do first and, and how much? I think conventional wisdom, because this is what we did last time, is that we would move the federal funds rate down to what we call the effective lower bound, just above zero, and then, if need be, turn to forward guidance and turn to quantitative easing. But you know, the notion of, so the reason I've, I've been outspoken on forward guidance more recently is I'm of the view, once we get down to zero, if there were a downturn and we move the federal funds rate to zero, and then we announce a commitment that we're going to keep it at zero for a while, I actually think that's kind of a weak commitment, meaning it's like you drive your car into a ditch. And then you announce, I'm going to stay in the ditch. You know? <laughs> Are you really choosing to stay in the ditch? Or did you end up in the ditch and now you can't get out of the ditch? So that's why I actually think it's more powerful to, for us to announce forward guidance when we're away from zero. And that's why I said we should announce forward guidance now, committing not to raise rates until we actually get inflation back to our target. So this is a little bit out of sequence of how the Fed did things in the past. But I'm of the view that I actually think this sequence would be more powerful. I think forward guidance, once you're already at zero, is not a sign of strength. It's actually a sign of weakness. You know, but I'm only one voice, so obviously yep. we haven't done it. So I haven't convinced my colleagues. Well, and, and I, I don't want you to, add, you, you know, I feel like you're speaking for the chair, but he, in his most recent statement, he talked about not, the Fed would be unlikely to raise rates, I, think, I believe it was, unless they saw persistent inflation above the Fed's target. Um, how close does that come to forward guidance? I mean, it's a statement, but... Sure. Look, I think every time... The reason that everybody, the Fed chairman, whoever the Fed chair is, you know, Jay Powell or Janet Yellen, they move markets because people interpret what they're saying as a window into the future. And so whether we like it or not, when we communicate to the public this conversation, it's hopefully making some contribution to the understanding of what the Fed may do in different scenarios. Whether we like it or not, that is a form of forward guidance. Yeah. And so I think people talk about wanting to understand in, in economic terms the Fed's reaction function, how we will react to different economic developments. And the Fed chairman talking about that is one scenario where he gave a window into how he thinks about it. I do think that that's a form of forward guidance. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'll move on to another question. This is uh, from Dane in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, he's got a couple of statistics and then a question. Uh, let me throw out a few statistics. 3.5% unemployment, 50-year low, 3% uh, wage growth, 1.7% uh, inflation. I suspect you'll get back to that. Why cut rates now? What happens when things slow down? Well, we've been undershooting our inflation target basically for eight years, below 2%, averaging around 1.6%. So we've been weak on inflation. And there's no sign that we're out of workers. If we were actually running out of workers, that's what maximum employment means, right? If we were running out of workers, you would expect to see wage growth accelerating. It's not. So think about our dual mandate. There's supposed to be intention. It's supposed to be like a seesaw where we're trading these things off. But we've been missing on both sides. That means monetary policy on average has been too tight. So to me, that's the simple explanation, which is if we actually want to achieve our dual mandate, we need to provide more support to the economy so we can get inflation back to target and actually use up the available slack in the labor market. Yeah. Yeah, how, we've had a lot of discussions about this with our fixed income team about the Fed's 2% two, uh, 2 target, which was, it's about 10 years or so, isn't it? The, the 2012, it was formally adopted, but more, less formally adopted in 95 or so. Okay, so it's been, around, it's been around for a while. How precise, do you think of it as a range? I mean, it's been running at, it's, core PC, I guess, is what the Fed uses, it's been about 1.7 maybe recently. Do you think of it as a range? How, 
how much tolerance is there around that 2%? And maybe also, how far above that 2% would you be willing to let inflation run? Well, we, we call it a symmetric target, <clears throat> which means, you know, 1.7 should be no worse than 2.3, symmetric target. And <clears throat> I would be comfortable if we were a little bit under, if at some time we were a little bit over. But when you've been a little bit under consistently, for the entire time you've had the target, you know, you're doing something wrong. So that to me is like we should, yeah, you're right, 1.7 and 2.0, not a big difference. But I'd be a lot more comfortable if sometime we were at 2.3 to balance off the 1.7. So from my perspective, just speaking for myself, if inflation got up to 2.3 for a few years, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Yeah. Um, good, okay, I will uh, move on to, oh, I guess, and what happens when things slow down, I guess is the other question. Yeah, so this is something that people commonly talk about, which is, oh, we're, we need to save our ammunition for a downturn. Don't cut rates now. We need to save our ammunition, keep our powder dry, save our bullets, pick your metaphor. They all kind of mean the same thing. If we cut now, we're going to lose the opportunity to cut in the future. And I just think it's fundamentally a flawed analogy. I think a better analogy is this. Imagine you're driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour, and you think there might be a hill on the horizon. Should you accelerate now? Should you wait and accelerate later? Should you slow down now to save your ammunition? There's no benefit to waiting, right? There's no cost. If you accelerate now and you increase your speed, you're just as able to take on that hill as if you waited to accelerate till you're there. So the notion that you're using up your bullets prematurely, I just think is fundamentally wrong. And I, again, I don't mean to be critical of the person who asked the question. We get this a lot. It's a very common metaphor but I just don't think it's right. I think a better one is accelerate now or accelerate later. But certainly, you know, let's, some people have said you should raise rates now so you should cut them later, All right? That makes no sense. That's like saying, I'm gonna slow down now so that if a hill comes, I can floor it when the hill comes, right? You're much better off just at least maintaining your speed than if the hill comes, you can take the hill. Yeah, well, and I think we've seen that the economy has been very sensitive to the recent rate cuts. Uh, you know, we saw in the fourth quarter when the market kind of fell out of bed, uh, it was the interest rate se sensitive sectors. It was housing, it was autos, it was all the things you would think. Uh, and they've recovered strong, particularly housing. As, as I'm sure you know, the economy rarely goes into a recession when housing is strong and housing has been stable. So maybe talk a little bit about the effect of the recent cuts on housing or other sectors of the yeah, economy. Yeah, I think you're right. I think housing has, if you look at a chart of housing starts, it, it follows the Fed very closely. I mean, it basically was climbing through 2018, then it started going down, and then the Fed went on pause in December. Basically, the chairman came out and said, we're kind of done raising rates for a while. You started to see a recovery, and then as the Fed has gone ahead and cut rates, you've seen a stronger recovery. And so it's working exactly the way it's supposed to work, which is what you said, which is the interest rate sent sectors of the economy that are sensitive to interest rates are absolutely responding as we would want them to respond as the Federal Reserve has changed its policy stance. And by the way, this is another example of forward guidance. So in December, the Fed had been forecasting more rate hikes. Then in January, the chairman came out and said, we're probably done raising for a while. So he changed the forward guidance. The housing market responded to that change just in language. We hadn't actually cut rates. Yep. Yep. And now we went ahead and cut rates in July, and it's responded. So that's actually proof that forward guidance actually does feed real economic activity. Great. Well, thank you. Um, shifting gears a little bit uh, to uh, fiscal policy, and I know it's not exactly your domain, but it, it certainly affects a lot of what you do. Uh, with the size of our current federal debt, uh, $22 trillion and growing, uh, is this concerning to the Federal Reserve? Uh, if so, how can we get it in control? And by the way, this is from Brian in St. Charles, Missouri. So if you do forecasts of where the debt is going, the forecasts are just very high, just up and up and up. Uh, and this is largely being driven by the fact that our society is aging and we're having fewer kids than we had in prior generations. And our, and our entitlement programs are generally funded by current workers paying for current retirees. So as that ratio goes imbalanced, those programs go into the red. So somehow, we have to reach political consensus on how to put those back into balance. And the levers are pretty simple. You can raise taxes, you can cut spending, you can means test. The politics are what's hard. So at the end of the day, this is an example of, I hope we can come together as a country and make these choices before we actually have a crisis. Now, today, 
as we said earlier, the 10-year treasury is around 175 or so. That means investors around the world are saying, hey, we still think treasuries are a good buy. It's an attractive place to put their money. Treasuries borrowing rates are very, very low based on history. That's really good news. The question is, how long can that go on? Can it go on for 10 years? Can it go on for 20 years or 30 years? Nobody knows for sure. And it's partially a relative game. So the US is the strongest major economy in the world. People have the most confidence in the US economy. Imagine a scenario where China really gets its act together and improves its legal system and improves its competitiveness and opens its borders, or Europe really gets its house together. Then you could imagine maybe those economies might look relatively more attractive than the US, in which case our runway might shorten. So it's very hard to know. Yeah, and when you're talking across countries, you, you get some odd results. I remember <clears throat> as a, a month or two ago, the uh, Greek tenure uh, was below the U.S. tenure. It's hard to justify that on the it is. on the basis of we weren't buying the Greek tenure. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess if you I guess if you had bought it 18 months ago, it would have been the best trade uh, anyone. Or in, uh, or in 2012 or whenever the yeah, prices was. It uh, would have been one of the best trades uh, you could ever do. Uh, so I have another question. Um, kind of related uh, from Eric uh, from Chicago. Uh, one thing that's gotten a lot of press lately, and I'm sure you've gotten questions on, is uh, modern monetary theory uh, or do deficits matter? And uh, you know, maybe as a related kind of follow up to the, to the last qu comments you made, uh, I think I've heard you comment that uh, the, the borrowing capacity of developed countries seems to be bigger than we thought. You know, Japan has been borrowing, it's got debt to GDP a lot higher than we do. Uh, I just mentioned Greek bonds, somehow, they, somehow they're yielding one and a half percent. How do we th think about deficits in the modern economy? This is, I mean, that's what you said, which is, I think we have much more debt capacity than we appreciated, maybe five years ago or 10 years ago, but that doesn't mean it's unlimited. And so the issue, you know, the Modern monetary theory gets a lot of play on Twitter, uh, but basically if anybody raises any questions about it, they say, well, you don't really understand it. Right? It's, a great, it's a great negotiating strategy. If you have a question with my proposal, it's because you don't understand my proposal. The, the segmentation I would make is this. If the US government wanted tomorrow to say, we're gonna go do a trillion dollar infrastructure plan and we're gonna debt finance it, I don't think there's any question that the US government could go raise a trillion dollars in the treasury market. It is a deep, liquid market. Investors around the world have confidence in the US. That is different than saying, you know what? All of your ongoing spending programs forever, if everybody has their favorite spending program, we're just gonna deficit finance those forever. So I, I, I make a distinction between debt financing and investment, where the US government says, hey, we think this is a good investment for the economy. It can generate more economic growth versus just ongoing spending forever. And I think the MMTers are more in the camp of just deficit finance all of your favorite spending programs and it'll, you'll never have to pay it back. Yeah. Uh, you know, go, talking about Europe a little bit um, and going back to your prior comment about the neutral rate, do you think that based on demographics, different these different countries, take Germany versus the US or Japan versus the US, have different neutral rates and, and that we could see just persistently disparate yields? Absolutely. I mean, you think about what goes into it. One is demographics. So we know that Japan's demographics are much worse than ours. Their society is aging. Their fertility rate is lower. Uh, we know that. And in fact, if you look at Japan on a per worker basis, their economy is growing basically as robustly as ours is. But you wouldn't know it because their demographics are so bad. Uh, and so what are they going to do about that? So here in America, we have historically used immigration as a huge boost of economic growth more workers to produce things, more consumers to buy things. Japan culturally is very resistant to immigration, so that is not a reasonable tool that they have available to them. It is for us. Now, we have to get our politics right, but this has been a huge source of economic growth for America. So, yes, I do think that the demographic differences, uh, legal systems are somewhat different, productivity, the adoption of technology, these will drive different neutral rate environments. And, and how does that play out? Presumably if the U.S. has persistently higher rates, more and more capital comes here, which is a great thing, which would give us more borrowing capacity potentially, but does that put a, an upper bound potentially on, on U.S. Treasuries? You know, hard to know. I mean, think about, uh, go back to what is the neutral rate? It is the rate that balances savings and investment in the economy. And the big challenge, why are rates so low? Where are the big demands for capital in the U.S. economy? The biggest demand for capital in the U.S. economy 
in the last decade has been in North Dakota, Oklahoma, and Texas, the oil fields. Massive capital flowed in to fund the exploration, the fracking, the new wells, et cetera. Requires a lot of capital. Where are the other big demands for capital? It isn't Facebook and Twitter. I mean, they're, we can debate whether or not they're productivity enhancing. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm on Twitter, but I'm not sure that it's actually boosting my productivity. But they're certainly not big destinations for capital. Where are the other big destinations for capital in the US? Where are the big new investments that are waiting to be made where you can earn a positive return? I think that that's unclear. So all of this stuff goes together in ultimately determining what is the neutral rate. Good, I'd like to come back to big tech in a moment, but you, you brought up immigration, and I know that's something you're, you're fairly passionate about. Maybe talk a little bit about how immigration impacts the U.S. economy and even helps drive Fed policy. I know you've talked about how you, you control the, the short end, you don't control, control the long-term economic growth. What role does immigration play in that long-term economic growth? Well, again, immigrate, well, where does economic growth come from? It comes from two things. One is productivity development. So we have technology to do more with the same inputs, which also, or education, right? The workers are smarter, more skilled, can do more with the same input. So productivity growth is part of it. The other part of it is simply population growth. More workers to produce things, more consumers to buy things. Productivity growth is very hard to adjust in the short term, right? When is, when is Elon Musk going to invent something new that really is transformation in the US economy? Your guess is as good as mine or some other inventor. Hopefully it happens, but you know, when, we don't know. The other one is math. Yeah. And I travel around our region, and I always say, look, we're having fewer babies. So you've got three choices, and I'm not going to offer you a moral judgment. You decide for yourself which of these three, th three choices you want. Number one is you can accept slower growth. Number two, you can try to do what Japan is trying to do and subsidize fertility. Usually people laugh when I say that, but you can give tax credits to families to have more kids. It's very hard, and it takes 18 years to grow a new worker, so it's not an overnight strategy. <laughs> or number three, you can embrace immigration. That's it, that's the math. And so I try to just lay it out that starkly for people, and one time, I'll confess, one time I had somebody in one part of our region say, you know what, I'll take slow growth, that sounds pretty good relative to the alternatives. Most people, when they hear those choices, say, wow, Immigration is really important to our country's economic growth, and I want our economy to grow. Coming back to, to, to big tech, you mentioned Facebook, one of the, the famous fang names. Um, we're at a period of time where uh, you know, large cap stocks have outperformed small caps to a historical degree, uh, and even more so, uh, growth has outperformed value. Actually, you, uh, the, the relative valuations are even uh, wider with uh, growth being more highly valued than they were in the tech bubble. You have to go back to the late 70s, at least according, according to our charts. Uh, you know, the more cyclical center, sectors like energy, financials have, have gotten hurt. Obviously, Europe being heavier in financials and, 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 and manufacturing has gotten hurt. Has something changed? I mean, you know, we, we sometimes, in our uh, investment meetings, you know, we talk, there's no small cap Facebook because it's a scale play. But now you could have said 20 years ago there's no small cap Walmart and, and Amazon still, still beat them. Uh, so, you know, how do you think, has something fundamentally changed or do you see anything in the economics that would indicate we may go to a more pro-cyclical? Boy, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you all would be much better uh, positioned than me to answer that. Uh, I guess I'm bullish on the U.S. economy and the innovation engine that it is. And while it seems like Facebook and Apple and Amazon are dominating, it wasn't long ago that we all had Blackberries and the research in motion was dominating. And nobody could have foreseen somebody coming along and knocking them out. And they've been knocked out. So, you know, most countries would love to have one of our tech titans. That would be the national champion for most countries. And we have almost all of them here. And so I think that, uh, you know, I, I mean, I understand a lot of people are concerned about how big they've gotten, they're so dominant, but I think the innovation spirit in the U.S. economy is still unchallenged. And I'm pretty optimistic there are going to be new newcomers that come along that shake it up in ways that we can't imagine right now. So maybe uh, another way of approaching my question, too, since you're in charge of monetary policy, is... Uh, the common theme that would benefit small caps, value, cyclicals, uh, energy, Europe, manufacturing, would be a steepening yield curve. You'd want to see economic growth in a steepening yield curve. Maybe a different way of putting it is, how likely do you, do you see that happening? What's going to get the neutral rate up? 
You know, where, again, where are the new big, imagine that Elon Musk, I'm just picking on him, because he's an inventor that we all heard of. Imagine that he invents some great new technology that is beneficial to all of us, and it requires $5 trillion of capital to scale. We'll find the $5 trillion of capital, and the neutral rate will go up, and the yield curve will be steep, and we'll have higher growth. So where are those new big technological breakthroughs? I don't know. And that's what's so hard about it is none of us knows. Yeah, yeah. So maybe just a, a personal question since we've got a few minutes left. Uh, you've been living in Minnesota for, what, about four years? Uh, what are some observations you have on our state, our lovely state? It's a, it's a wonderful state. I mean, I'm uh, really pleased. I heard, heard very good things about it, very high quality of life, genuinely very nice people. Uh, I happen to like the cold, so, you know, I've got that going for me. Uh, it was a, my wife, originally from the Philippines, but she lived in New York, so she was used to the cold before, uh, before we moved here. Uh, so, you know, it's been great. Again, I think the only thing that surprised me to the downside were these education gaps that we talked about earlier. Other than that, it's a very competitive economy. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of time meeting with our elected leaders. Whenever I go to Washington for FOMC meetings, I usually go up to Capitol Hill afterwards and meet with our representatives from the region. I think Minnesota has a, you know, we have our partisan politics like anybody does, but it's actually a pretty bipartisan state. You know, our, our elected leaders in Minnesota kind of get along with each other. They all seem to work well together. It's remarkable. Minnesota is the only state, I believe, in all 50 states that has a House and Senate that are divided across party lines. No other state is that true. So I think Minnesota actually kind of people get along with each other, even though they have their own ideas, and I think that's really great. What are you hearing about the economy in your district, which again includes Wisconsin and Montana, uh, 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 particular sectors outperforming, underperforming, particular areas of concern, maybe along yeah. trade lines? Yeah, exactly. Ag and manufacturing are both under pressure. Ag has been under pressure for many years because of low prices, and now when you add the tariffs and the trade war on top of it, it's just another challenge that farmers are having to deal with. And you hear anecdotes of a lot of farmers selling out. They just throw in the towel and sell out, so you're seeing more consolidation in the ag sector. And then manufacturers that are exposed to the global economy, the global economy is slowed, they're feeling it. And then those that are dealing with China or their tariffs, they're also feeling it as well. Both of those are have a kind of high anxiety sectors, which leads to, generally speaking, people pulling back. Yeah, and, and how, about, how about the medical device industry? You know, we have no one on several of these names, um, both regulatory, other concerns around the medical space. It's such a big part of the Minnesota economy and healthcare. You know, I visited uh, Med we had our board meeting up at Medtronic a few months ago. Um, our chairman is also on the board of Medtronic, so he hosted us up there, and we got to spend the day with the Medtronic executive team. They report that Minnesota's med tech community is very vibrant. And they weren't just talking about themselves. They were talking about the startups. You know, Medtronic is an acquisitive company. They're buying new technologies all the time. And it turns out quite a few of the companies that they acquire are homegrown from Minnesota. And that was actually a good proof point for me that Minnesota is generating a lot of innovation around the medical device space. So I think that that's really positive. Yeah. Uh, maybe sticking with trade, just to, for another question. Um, how do you see, what if any role, and I know it, it gets political in a hurry and, and we don't want it to go there, but what if any role does the Fed have in responding to an economic slowdown that's trade driven? Well, we have, you know, our goal is to achieve our dual mandate, stable prices and maximum employment. And whatever the cause of the slowdown is, we need to use the tools that we have to try to address that. And so if it is trade driven, that doesn't change the fact that we have our responsibility to try to, to try to achieve our dual mandate goals. It may well be that lowering interest rates is not a very good uh, solution to businesses that are nervous about tariffs and trade. That may well be true. But that, that doesn't absolve us from us using our tools to try to achieve the mandates that Congress has given us. Yeah. You know, we've seen... Um a, a kind of a bifurcation in the economy. You know, manufacturing, PMIs have been below 50 uh, globally for a while and, and domestically fairly recently, but yeah, the, the consumer and the service economy uh, has been very strong. How do you think about that bifurcation? How much do you think is attributable to trade? And it may be that you don't care how much is attributable to trade, you care what, about its effects on the economy, but how do you think about that bifurcation? In 2016, we had a similar situation, now some of it was energy driven, where manufacturing went into recession, but really for the first time in our history, the, the economy didn't. How do you think about a certain service sector and, and a consumer that's strong versus a manufacturing sector that's weak? Well, I think, we, I think we understand it. So I talked about the labor market has surprised us for the last few years. Most people 
Most people who want to work have jobs, and their wages are slowly climbing, and consumption is 70% of the U.S. economy. So that means families have a little more money in their pocket. They're able to spend that on themselves, on their families, food, et cetera. That's what's driving the U.S. economy. That's good news. But that's a backward-looking indicator. That's what they're experiencing today. That doesn't necessarily mean what they're going to experience six months from now. The business investment pulling back is more concerning because that is more about the future, about businesses saying where we expect the economy to be a year from now or two years from now. So I think the business investment pullback is more concerning, but it's not the whole story because the U.S. consumer is such a big part of the economy. Yeah, I agree. And we've been following the weak business investment uh, very closely. And, you know, this earnings season, earnings have come in a little better than expected, depending on how you measure it, kind of flat maybe and slightly positive compared to some, uh, some negative expectations. But what we've seen is... Uh, you know, revenue has actually been up a few percent, and earnings have been kind of flat, which would imply some margin compression. Uh, so if companies aren't investing in CapEx and we're not seeing the type of wage inflation you'd expect, we've been kind of racking our brains where that margin compression is coming from. Uh, is, do, you, do you think there could be more wage pressure than we're measuring, or...? You know, I'd be surprised. Uh, I mean, it's certainly possible, but we're seeing this, these lower more modest wage growth across a whole range of different measures. So I don't, I don't think it's just a mismeasurement issue. Uh, and again, if people are actually making more money, that's good news, right? It means families have more money to spend on themselves and meet their needs, and I think that that would be good news. Yeah, and of course, you know, we have a significant private equity portfolio, and we hear from our portfolio companies all the time, of course. Is, they can't find workers. We can't find workers, and I know your response to that, which is then you're not paying enough. Exactly. Uh, and so... Uh, <laughs> and, and if you're not increasing wages, then you're just whining. <laughs> Well, I, I really can't think of a better way to end than that. So uh, this has just been a delightful conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so appreciative. And uh, you're always welcome to come back to Thrive at any time. So thank, thank you very you much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.